Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card from Abu Dhabi, which starts Saturday. Uh, keep in mind, it starts at Saturday, 10 a.m. And as of this recording, we have a full 13 fight card. There are kind of varying rumors that some of the fights might be might drop off, but uh, we'll see. Uh, it would certainly be within the normal uh, pattern of conduct for the UFC. Uh, we haven't really gotten a full card uh, that would, that's that gone to completion in quite a while. Um, and as DFS players, we're kind of hoping that this whole 13 fight card just goes off as planned. Because what happens is, is in a full 13 fight card, you, you num number one, uh, you can, you know, you have a lot to choose from, obviously. But what that means is that you don't have to get that far off the board to have a unique lineup. You know, when you have 10 or 11 fights, you have to do all kinds of stuff that you really don't want to do to get unique. You know, leave a lot of money on the table, um, just go for extremely low owned plays. It's extraordinarily difficult to get unique lineups that have a shot. Um, and well, yes, that's the same challenge available to everybody. Um, I just particularly don't enjoy that. Uh, I, I rather enjoy the big 13 fight card where, you know, uh, you, you play kind of reasonable looking uh, looking plays, put them together in, a, in an intelligent way, and you have a shot. So with any luck, this 13 fight card fits that bill. The other thing about this card is that it is coming from Abu Dhabi. You have a couple of fighters that are from that region. You have, you know, fighters traveling to that region. The whole thing just sets up. I guess thematically as a card that's kind of ripe with variance. And when that happens, I have to caution you guys that and I say this a lot, that variance goes both ways. In other words, if, if someone is say listed as a minus 200 favorite and you say that, Oh my God, there's a lot of variance to that line. A lot of people get the idea that Ooh, maybe he's not as a, he shouldn't be as big of a favorite, but variance goes both ways. I mean, it's possible that, that the minus 200 favorite really should be a minus 400 favorite. So whenever you have a situation like that, it is important to realize that it does go both ways. All right, with that as kind of a, uh, a background, uh, let's get into the fights. And one thing about these, these fights is there is narrative stream you know, all throughout this card. I mean, you can make huge, you know, draw huge narratives and tell huge stories about a lot of these fights. And in a situation like that, you're better off just not doing it. You're better off just just relying on the numbers, getting back to basics, and not getting sucked into all of this nonsense. Okay, um, let's. Uh, I guess let's get going. Uh, first fight on the card. Like for example, you have Bruno Silva against. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce the guy's name. Shara Magomedov. And if you looked around, you can find all kinds of just crazy videos, and crazy stuff about this Magomedov guy. And if you just look at him, I mean, it's like one eye looks like God, I don't know what he looks like. He lives in a cave, for God's sake. You know, I don't, I don't know where this guy comes from. Um, but all of a sudden, no one's heard of him forever, and now he comes out as this big prospect with all these videos, and and uh, he's fighting Bruno Bruno Silva, who's a guy that we've heard of, and you know he's has moderate levels of success. We we've, we've won betting on him, won betting against him, lost betting on him, lost betting against him, whatever. So anyway, it's kind of a fight that is kind of ripe with variance. So let's just get just kind of the numbers here. So you have an $8,600 fighter against a $7,600 fighter. And the fact of the matter is, is that Magomedov has an extremely strong inside the distance prop for an $8,600 fighter. I mean, he's a minus 120 to finish um, or even minus 110, whatever. But these are the types of numbers that you expect from 9K fighters. So I, I know that it's not something people feel comfortable doing just – just just going attacking these these first fights of the night, especially waking up 10 a.m. to like sweat the first fight of an incredible card and just have too much exposure to to this guy you've never heard of, who's you know, when you have all these much, much more popular names, especially in the later fights. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it's an extremely strong inside the distance line. It's an extremely strong play. And um I don't think he's going to be that well owned um, by the field just because again, you know, people like you know, the names they've heard of, they don't like to bet fights in the first, uh, the first fight of the night for some reason. Um, 
But the fact is that he does look like an extremely strong player. Um, now, on the other side of this, you have Bruno Silva. And at his price, 7,600, you really need an inside the distance line on a big card like this of about plus, you know, worst, maybe plus 300 to make him really viable. It's just, he's just not quite getting there. You know, I mean, I don't know. Like one place has him at plus 265, another plus 325. So it's somewhere in the middle here, which basically means that he's about four to one to finish. And the problem is, is that, you know, if, if I knew that Magomedo was going to be incredibly popular, I would say, okay, plus 400, I'll squint and, 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 and take a shot because the metric, even though the metrics aren't that great. But again, I think I think it's such a big card that I don't think Mega Madoff is going to get enough ownership to really produce enough leverage to allow me to play Silva absent, you know, the absent better metric. So I'm probably gonna, gonna advise to play on the Mega Madoff side and probably pass Silva. Now, when I say pass in 150 max, yeah, sure. I mean you should play some of them. But when you're prioritizing and 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 you know, playing 20 max and things like that. I just don't think Silva makes it. Remember, this is a huge card. And and for to play these underdogs, uh, you you need to you can be greedy. You know, you want to play guy underdogs that either have incredible upside, have incredible metrics, or at the very least are fighting uh opponents that have you know uh, incredible metrics, which is going to mean that they're going to be pretty well owned. And we'll get to examples of that a little later. So let's start. I guess we can start by putting these favorite plays in here. So Maga Madoff right off the bat is amazing. Um, okay, so Dudakova against Naimov. Uh, excuse me, Dudakova against Jin Yu Frey. So you have Dudakova, who's like a million to one odds, and she's plus 500. It's actually pretty, you know, it's, it's a pretty reasonable price in DraftKings if you just look at the at, at the win odds here. I mean, minus 500, 600, that's usually correlates with a 93, 9400, but that's not enough. I mean, you, you also have to have a, a good amount of upside as far as the, you know, as far as your scoring goes. Um, now, with, when it comes to her inside distance line, it's really, it's not that bad, okay? It's like plus 170. You, you really would rather have someone with about minus 110 or better at this price. However, she does allegedly <laughs> have a lot of wrestling upside you know when i say allegedly i mean so much of her tape and so much of her of her results are coming in, in lower level regional fights that you know it, it's just not very reliable um but nonetheless on a big 13 fight card you know she's going to be i imagine extraordinarily low owned. okay um there's just much better options at her price tag or even below so if in fact she can kind of get it going and if in fact she can have, you know, get multiple takedowns, she is just alongside of a couple of these other fighters that we'll get to later that look like this, you know, due to COVID, you know, big win odds uh, inside the distance line, somewhere between, you know, pick them and two to one, you know what I mean? We'll get to some more like that. And she's, yeah, on the, on the, on the weaker side of the, of the, of the, you know, plus one fifty to plus 200 or whatever, but she does have the possibility of having a lot of wrestling upside. So I think that she is very playable in certainly playable in the 150. And this is the, exactly the type of play that could end up, you know, breaking the slate. You know, I mean, Jin Yu Fry. Um, yes. I mean, I, I, people have heard of her. She has okay takedown defense, but you know, what if she doesn't? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like so, if, if you if you avoid Dudakova, and it turns out that she is really as good of a wrestler as a lot of people say that she is, and she gets it going, we've seen this before with these wrestlers that one leads to another, leads to another, and she gets you know five takedowns and at a second round sub that could be 125 points. You know, so um, I would not throw her out of the mix, and I know it's scary, like right out of the gate to have two kind of lower level fights and lower level fighters when you have a fight card that's filled with all these all-stars but in gpps these are the these are the kind of plays you kind of have to make and 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 the Jin Yu free side again same problem i think that she's probably the line might be 
I shouldn't say the light line might be too might be too wide. That's not exactly the purpose of this uh, of this podcast. Um, but I don't know. She's plus four hundred to win. Her inside the distance line is really poor, and the problem is is that Dudikova is not going to be that popular, so you don't get the leverage. So don't think that Jinu Frey is going to be one of my preferred underdogs. All right, uh, and and moving right up the up the card here. I mean, we have we have a couple of more. You know, uh, in the first, you look at the first like seven fights. I mean, you can make arguments for every fight being playable. Now we'll get to you know, how to prioritize them later, but like Nathaniel Wood, for example. You know, he's you got to really figure out what you want to do here, because he's another one that looks very similar to, say, due to Kova, maybe a little worse. You know, he's his his inside the distance lines a little worse. He's plus 200 leaning towards 250, maybe. Um, and his win odds are not quite as good. He does have. You know, I don't say similar, but he does have wrestling upside. Um, sometimes he, he implements it. Sometimes he doesn't. I just don't think, I think the card is just too big to get to him. You know, I mean, he's got to not only get those takedowns and, and, and get the finish probably, um, but also outscore some of these others. It's one of the reasons why this dude, a Cobra play might be just, just, now that I'm thinking of it, maybe just too weak. I don't know. I'll have, to, I'll have to think a little more about this. But Nathaniel Wood, to me, is a very similar type of play, I suppose. Um, the only thing I would say is that I think that it's possible that the name off side might get a little bit of ownership, which would make Nathaniel Wood maybe a little bit of a better play than, say, Dudakova. I mean, you look at name off, he's plus, what, 300 to win. So he's about 25% to win. Let's look at his inside the distance line. I mean, it's ugh, not really. It's like plus 500. No one's playing him. So I guess not. So I guess Wood is very similar to Dudakova. You got to play them in 150. Okay. But but as far as priorities, maybe they just fall a little bit short. But as we go through these, you're going to see a lot of fighters that are just kind of just like that. Like you look at Anshul Jubilee. I mean, what's really the difference between jubilee and these others but you can argue that jubilee might be a little better let's let's see here so you have jubilee's 9300 we're comparing him to say uh due to covid 92 and say for now uh wood at 9k jubilee his inside the distance line i think is a little bit better now that i think of, now that i remember let's see jubilee inside the distance where is it yeah, he's a little better. He's actually about minus 110. So this is a little bit stronger. Um, and, and not to mention, he also has takedown upside. Um, in his last fight, he, he won basically by like taking down and controlling his opponent the whole fight um, until I think he got a second round late sub. The other thing is that I'm, I'm hearing a lot of steam on Breeden, that Jubilee is kind of a fraud and he's terrible and stuff. So it's keeping this line down. Um, I mean, it's, is it possible that Breeden gets some ownership as a result? I, mean, I don't know. I, mean, I can't, I can't play Breeden with this inside the distance line. The only thing I would say is that if Jubilee ends up sort of popular, then maybe Breeden's an okay bit of leverage, but I don't know. I think we, I think we can get away without playing those, these types of underdogs today. Uh, we'll get to that, but I think Jubilee is very, very reasonable here i think jubilee is probably better than all the other nine k's that we've discussed so far um so let's let's put him in let's put him alongside of magomed as kind of our core to start off with um i have a feeling we're going to get to better options later but let's just kind of start with this all right uh moving on uh Cedric dumas versus abu azatar um at first glance, I mean, when you just stare at it, it looks like a fade, but when you get under under the, the hood here, it's not that bad. You look at the pricing here, Dumas is 8,400 against 7,800. I mean, you, you take a look at the win odds for openers. Um, He's a plus 200 at 8,400. I mean, that's that's a hell of a lot of line value there. I mean, I'll, I'll start with that. And then... 
inside the distance, I mean, it's almost a pick em. I mean, how is this any worse than, honestly, than the, than the, than that first play? I mean, the inside the distance line is pretty close, and yet he's cheaper. Um, the the only thing about it is that people just think that he's bad. But I don't know. That's that's not for this discussion. I think this is a good play. This is pretty crazy. But he actually looks like a – is it a better play than even Magomedov? And it's possible. And I also don't think he's going to be particularly high on because, I mean, we'll get to it. There's going to be an extremely high-owned play right around him, which we'll get to probably next fight, fight after. We'll see. Oh, let's take a look at Azatar, by the way. Um, Azatar on the other side. His inside the distance line. 400, and there's another one. I mean, it's just, it's, all these look pretty bad so far, as far as underdogs go. Uh, Javi Basharat versus Victor Henry. All right, this looks like a, a very similar fight to some of the ones that we've discussed. Very high win odds implied by Vegas. High price tag, 9,400. And he's got a similar skill set. I mean, he's got the, like, he's he's like Jubilee, he can wrestle. Like Nathaniel Wood, he can wrestle. Javi Basharat, I think he's actually more likely to wrestle than, than Nathaniel Wood. Um and he also has a kind of a poor inside the distance line, right? I mean, you look at his inside the distance line. I mean, it's really poor. It's like plus 220. Um, and the question is, is his is wrestling enough to overcome that inside the distance line? I think that on a big card like this with a lot of options, I think it just falls a little short. I think it falls in that same bucket of maybe Nathaniel Wood, and and Dudakova, like like good enough for 150, but probably not good enough for 20 max. I, I just prefer the Jubilee play at a very similar price, if not worse, and not better, with a similar style uh, uh, edge, and also, you know, more finishing upside. So I think Basharat is in that kind of second tier. All right, so so here's the um, I imagine the big bit of chalk uh, for this uh, for this card. You have Trevor Peak versus Muhammad Yaya. And this fight, first of all, is extremely favored to end inside the distance, minus 350. And the first thing I'll point out is that Trevor Peak, he's got steamed up to minus 170. And the problem is, is that his, his price reflects a pick em price tag. He's 8,200, which prices him at about minus 120. So he has an extreme uh, bit of line value, not to mention the fact that his inside the distance line is kind of insane. Like his inside the distance line, I believe is minus 110. We'll take a look at it. Yeah, he's minus 110. And like I said earlier, I mean, these are the types of inside the distance lines we're expecting of 9K fighters. And this is kind of the third one that looks really good, really cheap. And this one also has a lot of line value in there. So he looks like just an extreme smash play, I mean, to say the least. Now, uh, whenever you have an extreme smash play, you have to take a look at the other side because one of you know the things to you really have to appreciate about, about DFS and, and MMA particularly is that the way you get leverage and the way you play GPPs is to identify great plays and play good plays against them. okay the idea is that if muhammad yaya shows up as as a decent play even though it's not as good of a play as trevor peak he's going to show he's going to be a, a really really strong play because of how popular trevor peak is going to be now if you look at the money line i mean obviously he's got reverse money line issues i mean he's 8k and he's being priced as if he should be 7600 so we have a problem there and we'll take a look at the inside the distance line the inside the distance line puts him at plus 250. And plus 250 is 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 okay for an 8K fighter. Forget about his money line for a second. If, if I told you just right off the bat that you had an 8K fighter is plus 250, I would say, okay, that's that's not bad. I mean, I could I could go with the field on him. The question is, is that good enough, number one, to be to for you to play on a 13 fight card? 
the only way it's good enough is if you're getting enough leverage on the opponent and, and, and he is going to be really popular. And the question of whether you get enough leverage with Yaya to overcome probably, I don't want to say bad metrics, but kind of like just good or okay metrics. I think it's a really close call. I really do. Um, Normally, this is exactly my type of play, and I would say just go ahead and play Yaya. It's very similar in a way to the um, that Chepe Mariscal fight, where Mariscal fought Peak, and it was the same thing. You know, it'd be these look basically the same, except in that fight, you had Mariscal had a little bit better inside the distance prop, and he had wrestling. Um, this one, Yaya really doesn't have wrestling, so it's it's a little bit worse. Um, I might go ahead and do it and play Yaya. But uh, it's not as much of a slam dunk as the Mariscal play was. Um, so uh, I think that you should probably get both sides of this. I don't think you should go all in on peak, really. Um, because, again, I think that Yaya's, you know, is uh, the leverage is kind of is, is pretty important here. Um, and while he's not a great play, I think he's good enough to, to play him, I guess, maybe even a, not quite as much of his win odds, but if you wanted to go 100% in this fight, I think you could get away with 70% peak, 30% yeah, yeah. I think that's reasonable. And I do believe that playing 100% of this fight is not the worst idea in the world. I mean, there's just no, I just can't see a world where the winner of this doesn't get there into the optimal somehow. How, how do you not score 100 points winning this fight? You know, for Yaya yeah to win, I mean, I guess you get a DQ, but how is Yaya yeah winning without scoring 100? Because I don't think he gets a decision if he's just a striker. You know what I mean? Like, I, Pete just brings the heat just too much, you know? Um, I guess the only way this fight doesn't really get there is if maybe peak round two I, without a lot of knockdown. I, I have no idea. So uh, this fight is obviously a key fight, and it's only a question of how much you want to, you know, how much you want to weight these guys. Uh, for now, I will put Peak in. Oh, as I did already. Mm. Okay, moving up. Tim Elliott versus Muhammad Mikhaev. Let's hear it. Here, here we go. Here's another one. You have a big favorite who's priced over 9K. Uh, Mikhaev is 9,600, actually, the most expensive. And his inside the distance line. Let's see if it's good enough because I know he's got the wrestling. Mikhaev inside the distance is, yeah, I mean, it's minus 150. It's very, very strong. And he's got wrestling. So, I mean, that, that, that's the point is, is that when you play these other guys like Daniel Wood and Dudakova and, you know, and even uh, Basharat, these are the types of guys you're competing with. And, you know, the Mikhaev's, you know, his metrics are just, just much stronger. Um now, Makayev also is a lot pricier. So you could argue that that if, if playing, you know, these other guys like Wood or Basharat or Dudakova or whatever, if that accesses you to other fighters that you wouldn't have access to by paying that extra 600, then yes, you could certainly make the case to, to bump those guys up. But just straight on as a play, I mean, and it should be the case at 9,600. He looks really good. Um how do you compare Makayev to Jubilee, though? Um, well, I, I think they're priced very reasonably. In other words, I mean, comparatively to each other. Jubilee, his win odds are a little worse. His inside the distance line is a little worse. And his wrestling might be a little worse. So he's giving up, you know, 300 salary points. So I, I guess I guess it's somewhat efficient. So, again, it's just a question of between the two of them, which do you need the 300? You know, if you don't need the 300, play Makai. Okay. Um, and if you do, play Jubilee. I mean, for openers. I don't think you're getting away with playing both of them, the way the slate works out. But we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So we can't really put him in. It's got to be one of these two in this lineup. So let's take Makai. We'll take Jubilee out for now just so we remember you know, what we're doing here. All right. Um, Saeed Magomedov versus Muin Gafarov. Um, all right. So minus 200, 
his price is 8,800. All right, so now we have an issue because he's priced a little higher than some of these other fighters we've already talked about with very similar metrics. Um, so he's, like I said, he's minus 220. You compare him to say Dumas, who's at higher price, excuse me, higher win odds, who's going to be cheaper. You have um, even uh, Magomedov, which much higher win odds with a much higher inside the distance line who's going to be cheaper. So, you know, Nurmagomedov is probably going to be kind of a contrarian play because of that. But let's take a look at the in inside the distance line. Nurmagomedov inside is like plus 140. You know, he just doesn't quite get there. He's not really a wrestler. I think he's just going to have to take a seat in my priorities. Uh, he's, you know, he's not going to – I can't leave him off 150 again. I'd probably have to play everybody 150. But um, can't quite – get there as a priority they're just they're just too many better options below him you know all right so uh his opponent uh gafarov again since nirmagomedov again is going to be low owned i imagine or lowish owned for us to play him he really has to have good metrics on his own and let's just see for his price he's got to have it inside the distance line of plus 300 you know at least let's see ah oh, it's close is this different? I mean, this is not much different than, say, Bruno Silva, right? He's got a very similar inside the distance line. Well, wait a minute. So Gaffrov is plus 350. Let's compare him to Silva for the hell of it. Silva is worse. So, okay. So Gaffrov is better than Silva, that price. That's that that's something. Um, what about Azatar? What was his inside the distance line? Plus 400, so he's better than Azatar. Uh, Victor Henry, who we didn't talk about, by the way, uh, he does not have, you know, he doesn't have great leverage. Before I forget about him. His inside the distance line is, looks, I mean, this looks awful. This is, I might, I might try this, like a million to one. What is this, a thousand? He does have a lot of volume. So if he wins a striking-based decision somehow, he could get there. So actually, I do think Henry is actually kind of a weird, a weirdly, ugh, win odds are just so bad. I was about to say it's a weirdly decent under up, but I'm, I'm going to give that up. Um, the other thing, by the way, I didn't talk about, I'm doing a pretty bad job with the underdogs here. I didn't talk about Tim Elliott either. Tim Elliott, and I'll get back to the gaffer up in a minute. Tim Elliott could be okay because his win odds plus 350. He's fighting at least someone who I think could be somewhat popular. I don't know. His inside the distance line is terrible. I don't know. I guess he's just, just not the greatest. But back to Gafarov here. I haven't seen anybody yet with a better inside the distance line for his price. So I don't know if you have to play somebody. I guess he's okay. I mean, Nurmagomedov, again, is not going to be too popular, so it's kind of hard, but I think Gafrov's an okay bit of bit of long shot. And if you believe in this kind of thing, he's from the area, I think. So if they, you know, they go to a split decision, you know, you might get a little home cooking for uh, for Gafrov. All right. Uh, Ikram Ali Skarov, I was uh, present to see him beat uh, Phil Hawes in his last fight. Um, really knocked him out hard. Um, he's a huge favorite, minus 600. And I presume he's going to be really high priced. He's another 9,500. So again, this, when you see guys like this, and we look at his inside the distance line, which is going to be great. I mean, it really makes it difficult to play those Nathaniel Wood types. So Al Scarra, for example, we'll look at him. His inside the distance line is just insane. I mean, it's minus 250. I mean, that's the same as what's his name from before. Um, um, actually, we didn't, we, I, I think this is the guy we were talking about, exactly, actually. So, um, I mean, this is an extremely ridiculous inside the distance line. It puts him, I think, really at the top of the, of the 9K guys, like for now. Um, you also factor in that he's got wrestling. Oh, we're talking about Makaya. 
isn't it Ali Skarov a better price, a better play than Makayev? What was Makayev's inside the distance? Oh, he was the other I was thinking about. Makayev's inside the distance line, what was he? Minus 160 or so, maybe not even, maybe 150. And Ali Skarov is definitely a better play than, than him. So, you know, Makayev does have more takedown upside, I guess, because but it's kind of hard to explain, but Tim Elliott has pretty good takedown defense, which means that it's possible that Makayev gets multiple takedowns. But I think we have to say that Ali Skarov is a better play than Makayev. So when we're building these like this, this is what they're going to look like. And because of that, Alves is going to be, you know, listen, he's going to have a lot of leverage, but it's just win odds are just no good. You know, he's going to win the fight. According to these odds, one out of every, you know, 20% of the time at best. You know, so Alves is just not going to make it. Magomed and Kalaya versus Johnny Walker. Just here's, here's, going to be, here's going to be another one in that kind of bottom tier. Because again, you have, Bottom to that second tier of big favorites because you have Uncle Ivy, he's, he's good enough. He's minus 350. He is, well, I shouldn't say this because let's look at this. He's 9,100. So for us to want to play him, remember, remember all the other inside the distance lines we've been seeing here. Ankalaya inside the distance is, is a very healthy minus 120. He does have the possibility of wrestling upside. He doesn't always go for it, though. So he does look like a decent play. He's I definitely be lower owned than some of these other minus one, these other guys that we talked about, like like like, like uh, Makayev and um, is he going to be lower owned than Jubilee? That's a good question. Is he a better play than Jubilee? I don't know. They have the same inside the distance line. Does Jubilee have better, more takedown upside? It's a good question. Sometimes Ankalev does it, sometimes he doesn't. So I guess those are very similar. I, I think Jubilee and Ankalaya are both very similar. And I think that they're both, I mean, they're, they're not as good of a play as Alice Skarov, but but they're they're lower priced. And as we get when we're going through this, I think that though, I think saving that money might end up being more important than I first thought. Um, we'll, we'll see. But um, I'm glad of it is, you know, obviously pretty reasonable at that price. Walker, unfortunately, I mean, I don't know why this is the case, but he has a very, very poor inside the distance line. I mean, he, Walker inside the distance, I mean, I would want him to be like, like plus like 400 or so. He's, actually, he's not that bad. Plus 450? But it's Ankle Lab is not going to be even that popular. So again, Walker is kind of on the poor side of the underdogs, I suppose. So now we get to kind of the meat potatoes here. You get to Shemaya Uzman and, and Makachev Volkanovsky. And this is where you get a lot of the um the the, the rumors and stuff. You, you have rumors that maybe Usman pulls out of the fight, or at the very best, is it will continue the fight, even injured. There was some footage of him, you know, sparring with Justin Gaethje uh, recently in the last couple of days, and he apparently said that his knee might have popped. But uh, I've heard different takes on this. I've heard that his knees have always been bad or whatever. So, um, again, trying to put all the narratives aside here, I and mean, you have – Chemayev, who's minus 330, who's just as good of a price, just as good win odds as some of these others. And you look at his inside the distance line here. Chemayev inside the distance is solid, like minus 120. And he's got wrestling upside. I mean, he's just got to jump to the top of the list, I imagine, right? He's got to jump ahead of, of, does he have to jump ahead of Alex Skarov? I mean, I was scared of his bigger win odds, and he does have a better inside the distance line, but not by that much. 
Um, and you saved a 600. I mean, he's, he's got to, he's got to jump to the, to the top of this. Right. And so this is looking like what cash I guess will look like. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, all right. Uh, and on the other side of this. Okay. So here we can talk because, because Chimaev is going to be, I, I believe the most popular fighter on the slate, if, if not him, then it would be probably Trevor Peak. Again, we'll, we'll we'll look at you know ownership projections a little later in the week, but I I think that's probably safe. That that it's going to be either Chimaev or Peak is the highest owned. Um, I don't think it's going to be the main event, although the main event is probably going to be second and maybe third. We'll get to that in a second. Second, or it's going to be third and fourth, something like that. So the point is, is that if you've got it in you to play Usman even with the news of the knee and then all the stuff, you're just going to have to do it, you know, because you just get extreme leverage um, on, on Shemaev here. Um, and, you know, you look at his inside the distance line, I'm sure it's going to be look really poor. Usman, he's plus probably plus 700. I'm just, I'm just guessing. Usman inside the distance. Where is it even? Usman inside, it's like plus 700, as I said. And obviously that's really poor. And he does have, I guess, some wrestling upside, I suppose. But it's just that the leverage is just so insane that you're just going to have to shot, take a shot, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I guess you I guess you put Usman in there. Uh, I, I prefer not to, but if you have to play these underdogs, I mean, I think that this is what you have to do. I think you have to play the leverage spots like this. And then you get to the main event, which is, you know, from a fan perspective is awesome. These guys put on a show the last time they fought. And, I, you know, I imagine it's very similar. You know, you, you have Volkanovsky, who's just an incredible fighter with a lot of experience. who's seen it all. And, and you have Makachev, who's an incredible fighter, who's, who's, who's on, on the come up. You know, he's getting better every fight. So in their last fight, you had pretty close fight. Uh, Volkanovsky did really, really well to make it close. Makachev, I think, you know, got the fair win. Uh, but since then, you'd have to imagine that Volkanovsky might, I don't say it's gotten worse, but it's more likely that Makachev's gotten better. And and the fact is, is that Volkanovsky is taking this fight on short notice, which obviously gives uh, Makachev another another boost. So Makachev's got to be the rightful favorite. Um, and it's minus two, 260 or so. And, you know, this is a pretty fair price for Bob, for Makachev. Um, considering it's a five round fight, considering the takedown upside, considering also, I mean, look at the inside the distance line as well. I mean, it's, uh, let's see. Makachev inside the distance, probably, I would say minus 110, right? We're just going to guess. Mm, where is this? One forever. Um, no, nah, not quite. Yeah, maybe. Minus 180, it's kind of hard to say, but it's around 110, whatever. I mean, it's a really strong inside the distance line for his price anyway. He's got five rounds to work with plus wrestling. I mean, this is maybe he is more popular than Shemaev, now that I think about it. I mean, all of these just kind of combine for a great, you know, for a great play. The only thing that might keep him from being the most popular play on the slate is because of how, what a great play Volkanovsky is going to be on the other side, you know, and and Volkanovski is clearly going to be the, the highest owned fighter, on, highest owned dog on the slate. Uh, I don't think he's going to be the most popular fighter. Although, I mean, I, I think it's possible. Just because of the way construction works. And, and the, as I've been going over these, I, I don't really see that many underdogs showing up as great plays. Um, so... Is this possible that Volkanovski even higher owned than Makachev? I don't, I don't think so. But Volkanovski is obviously a great place. First, he's only he's not that big of an underdog for openers, and he's got five rounds to work with. You know, he could his inside the distance lines plus is is no worse than any of these other underdogs we talked about, and he's got five rounds to, to work with. I mean, he's definitely the best underdog on this, to say the least. So. Um, Fortunately, we can't play this exact lineup because we're minus 300, we're 300 over. But 
the, 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 the point of this is that I think that these mid range plays are going to be extremely useful. You know, the, the obvious, and, and the more I say that, the more I'm convinced that the, that peaks ownership is going to be insane. Um, just because of what else he does. And the other thing is I can't, I can't imagine Dumas not being really popular, but just nobody seems to like him for some reason. So if Dumas, Dumas comes in less than 20% owned somehow, that's, that can't be right. He's 8,400. He's minus 250, right? Plus, plus a good inside the distance line. I, I, this is, seems kind of crazy. So some middling type build with only one, if not, maybe no fires over 9K at the end of the day. Might end up being sort of contrarian, you know. Um, what you could do, you can't quite get there. We well, can't play, first of all, you can't play Makachev. Well, you could play Makachev and Volkanovsky together. Not, I wouldn't do it on a 13 fight slate, though. Um, and you could play Usman. No, you, can, you couldn't even quite play Usman and him together here anymore. So we're going to build like this. I don't even know if I do this because you have to dig into all these underdogs I didn't like too much. Okay, the one that I might take a shot, maybe the Victor Henry. Just because if he wins, he might put volume up, I suppose. I don't know. But anyway, uh, hopefully all of that helps. Really, really fun card. Hopefully it stays all 13 fights. And uh, stay tuned tomorrow for the betting breakdown, which is very contrary and a lot of fun. Uh, good luck, everybody.